Hello everyone, welcome to the first lecture devoted to magnetic advanced materials. Today I'm going to speak about motivation, magnetism, everyday life. But before, let me briefly show you the content of this lecture. So we, after the motivation part, we will switch to atomic origin of magnetism and here we will recall to some of the basics of atom physics and the main question is what is actually the source of magnetic properties of our body. Then, depending on which body, a solid body you have, when you put it in magnetic field, it can have different response to it. And depending on the response, we could define these large families of um, materials, so diamagnets, paramagnets, ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, and this will be the topic of this lecture. Moreover, we of course will discuss dipole dipole and exchange interactions, which uh, helps us to understand this behavior. Then we will switch to main families of uh, insulating ferro, antiferro, and also ferromagnetic materials like garnets, spinels, perovskites, so on. It will go here. Then 1.6. A lecture will be devoted to magnetism in metals and alloys. The point is that when you switch from insulating materials to metals, to conductors, then you need to use different models to describe your magnetic properties. And this will be discussed here. Afterwards, we have two small but very interesting parts. First one is about magnetostrictive materials, so materials which change their shape or size when you apply magnetic field and about ferrofluids, which are nothing else as a liquid magnets. In the technology part, we will discuss different types of magnetization imaging techniques. So magnetization is a total magnetic moment of your body normalized per volume, and uh, it's kind of one of the main property of magnetic uh, material. And here we will discuss how you can measure it. And the lecture will be close to this application part. There are only three types of applications selected. First of all, we will speak about permanent magnets, which are used, for example, in motors. Then we will discuss data storage, an example of hard disk drives. And there will be a basic understanding of magnetic resonance imaging, which can be positioned as bio application. So let us come then to the magnetism in everyday life. So here I would like to start with history of magnetism. Uh, history because of two reasons. First of all, it will help you to understand the um, way how physical discoveries are going on. So imagine you put yourself uh, on a position of a physicist somewhere here in these times and you know already something and there is a huge amount of information which is not discovered yet and if you do this and you put yourself in the position of researcher it's much easier for you also to understand the physics behind yeah? because you know how the way how a person was thinking and second in, uh, reason why I put here history is that it will help us to refresh our memories of about electrodynamics which you studied earlier and which is not covered in this course. So a magnet is a material or object that produces a magnetic field. That's what we know very well and this magnetic field we cannot see but we know that because of this field if we have such two magnets they can attract or repel, uh, repel each other depending on how you place them. And the first mention about magnetism go to 3,000 years before Christ. Uh, and in China, actually seen different uh, dates, also 300 years before Christ. And what archaeologists have discovered is this kind of spoon. And uh, it can be magnetic. And they assume that it could be used as a compass for navigation. Because there is a critic that it's too heavy, it would never rotate, staying on such a desk. Other people say that they could put it on water and something swimming and then it's fine. Uh, so, but this is something to discuss for historians. And we switch to Greece, to 800 before Christ, to this material, iron 3 oxide 4, which is named magnetite. Here you can see the magnetite and this are the strange stones. People have noticed that they attract each other or repel. And this magnetite actually gave a name to magnetism. 
we are always discussing with colleagues if world uh, magic and magnetism are coupled or not, and which one was first, if they are coupled. Uh, this I cannot answer you, but uh, there is even a book, Magic and Magnetism, I think 150 years old or something, which you can try to read. Good, and we're moving on to Pierre de Maricourt, 1269, who has found that there are magnetic field lines and poles. And moreover, he has found that identical pole, uh, poles are repulsing and different poles, opposite poles attract each other. So this was already a big step in understanding. Afterwards, we have a break, Middle Ages, in science, and we are coming back to the further development in 1770 by John Michael, who has found that if you take this magnet and cut it in the middle, you will not separate S and N pole. Instead, you will get again two poles in each of this piece. This was important discovery. And next step was done by Ampere, who has found that if you have two wires and there is current flowing in them, there will be force between them. So it's kind of first evidence that there is some relation between electricity, which is discovered that time and magnetic field. Then we have Hans Orsted, 1890, who has discovered uh, that uh, if you have um, wire with current it will create field around named Osted field yeah you use it everywhere and there was a needle next to it and it was filling this field uh, there is you can google there are many stories about but principally uh, his students said that this discovery was done accidentally during the lecture when he was showing some completely different experiment with electric currents on his desk was a compass and students have noticed actually that uh, arrow is rotating uh, but again, here, it was quite a long time ago, hard to say something definitely, but the truth is that some very important physical discovery happening are happening in a very unusual, unexpected way. Then we are coming to Henry Faraday, who has found that uh, the opposite effect that electric current can be also generated by moving magnets. So if you move magnet, you can induce electric current. It was great. And then um, James Clerk Maxwell, created Maxwell equation, which summarized all this and principally Maxwell equation so, uh, described all electrodynamics. Good. And we are coming to the magnetism in, our, uh, in everyday life. And the first what is coming to head when we're talking about magnetism is of course compass. A compass always, a compass needle always points on north. And why is that? Because in our Earth, there is this liquid magma inside. It also contains metals, conductive, and Earth is rotating and like kind of dynamic machine, it creates um, a magnetic field around and compass fills this uh, fields and was used for navigation. Uh, human beings is not the only, um, uh, not the only beings which are using magnetic fields. For example, there is very interesting uh, research about birds. Because people, so researchers suspected that they also feel magnetic fields. And then I remember was experiment when they placed such a magnetic ring on neck of um, birds to see if it changed something because you kind of switch off magnetic signal. Or you create much, much stronger another one. And really birds started to fly in two opposite directions. And according to my knowledge over the last years, they have uh, discovered that uh, birds have some special magnetic protein and molecules into in their eyes and in some sense they really see these magnetic fields most likely and then they use them for navigation second example of magnetism is credit cards so here on each credit card there is such a magnetic uh, stripe which contains not too much information but very important information about our money and we use it in everyday life then of course you know about magnetic recording hard disk. Uh, so you know nowadays that uh, there is SSD, solid state drive, flash memory. Uh, that one has nothing to do with magnetism, it's solid state uh, physics, uh, it's semiconductor. And uh, nevertheless, maybe not all of you know that uh, the data storage on clouds, because nowadays we use more and more often clouds 
we don't want to keep information on our computer, we just need access to internet and then we can store as much as we need. And these clouds use hard disks. Therefore, hard disks are alive because they are cheaper, they can then uh, compress information more dense and it's stored for a longer time. So hard disks are still very important in our life. And um, there are also another concept like magnetic random access memory, which we'll discuss in Spectronic Spark, also is nowadays. And actually, I for a long time was thinking that uh, the largest money which uh, we have in industry are in data storage. But it was surprised that this is not the case. The largest money are sitting in the permanent magnets because permanent magnets are needed for electromotors. And electromotors we use everywhere. This is, for example, just photo from Wikipedia about on Tesla. So for Tesla, you need electromotors, but it's for industry, for at your home place, and so on and so on. Motors are used everywhere. And also, if you want generators, for example, for this um, green energy sources, they also use the same uh, magnets. We are moving on. Nowadays, if you will take any modern car, there are tens of different sensors which measures everything to make sure that you're driving safe and everything is running well. And uh, many of them use magnetic materials for sensing. We have this in Shanghai, this crane levitating. Of course, in order to make this levitation, you first of all, you need superconductor, but also it requires permanent magnet. In science, for example, particle accelerators or mass spectroscopy or everywhere, practically a lot of uh, many different applications, scientific applications, we really need huge magnetic fields. And uh, here, we cannot do much without magnetic fields. And also, we shouldn't forget about medicine. Uh, magnets are used in many different um, fields of medicine, but probably the most known is magnetic resonance imaging shown here and uh, magnetic field as far as i remember here you need to apply 1.5 tesla field which is quite large but it's not a problem to apply such a large field if you have a di small distance between your poles of magnetic materials but if you have to put here a human being inside of this magnetic material everything is getting very large and that's how this why this machine is so large so this is few directions of the usage of magnetism. And now I would like to show you a video. Uh, so uh, I am a member of technical committee of IEEE uh, Magnetics chapter. And jointly with uh, Matthias Kloy from the University of Mainz, we got a task to make a promotional video for, to manage uh, uh, preparation of promotional video for uh, IEEE about magnetism. And I think it fits very well here and will explain you a few more directions. So let's enjoy watching it. Spin is everywhere. The small magnetic moments, the spins, enable many modern devices in our daily life. And these range from smartphones to electromobility, from medical diagnostics to the electric guitar. Magnetism is found naturally in minerals like magnetite, and this was known in ancient times in Greece and also in China, where magnetite was used as a compass. Spins are a fascinating topic with academically exciting new findings coming out daily. And at the same time, spins enable new applications. Spins are the fundamental constituents of magnetic materials and magnetism is a core part of the curricula in subjects ranging from physics to materials science and electrical engineering. Students learn about the fundamental details of the quantum mechanical spin, which is important in many fields, from chemical reactions and quantum technologies to the applied development of disruptive new magnetic devices. One type of magnetic device that is found all around us is the magnetic sensor. For instance, dozens of these sensors are used in every modern car. Magnetic sensors precisely identify the location of the magnet. If the magnet is attached to the shaft of a motor, the sensor can precisely read the speed of rotation. 
One of the discoveries which has revolutionized modern sensors and digital data storage devices is the giant magnetoresistance effect. Imagine two permanent magnets separated by a non-magnetic metal such as copper. Let's say we're able to fix the magnetic orientation of the lower layer such that its magnetization always points towards a certain direction. If we then switch the orientation of the top layer, it was found that there is a giant change in the resistivity across these layers. This allows for detecting even small magnetic fields, which makes the modern magnetic sensors highly sensitive. To fabricate these high-quality ultra-thin layer stacks, sputtering is used. Using sputtering, we can deposit just a few nanometers of high-quality material, for example, magnetoresistive multilayers, on top of silicon wafers. In modern fabrication machines, the process can be fully automated for scalability and reproducibility. The thin layers will be structured into well-defined nanoscale elements using lithography techniques. To reduce the risk of contamination during processing, all of this has to happen in very clean environments known as clean rooms. In addition to sensors, we can also make devices for information technology. Why do we need to make better, faster and more efficient magnetic devices? Because we produce more than 11 trillion bytes per second all over the world. This is a hard disk of your computer, what you use every day to store your emails, your photos, your movies, or even your information on clouds. The basic idea to save one bit of information is very simple. We use a so-called magnetic domain, which can be magnetized in two different directions. If it's magnetized like this, it's a logic zero. If in another direction, then it's a logic one. Now, if we have billions of such domains, we can store any information, for example, your movie. The question is how we can switch the magnetization from one direction to another. The latest generation of hard disks, so-called hammer systems, use short laser pulses to do the job in the presence of a weak magnetic field. But can we do it faster? Here in our laboratory, we explore what is the maximum switching speed for a magnetic domain. And to do that, we use the shortest laser pulses which are available nowadays. Our lasers generate laser pulses with only 10 femtoseconds pulse duration. This is really short. The light, which, as we know, travels with the maximum speed possible, makes in 10 femtoseconds only a distance which is smaller than the diameter of a human hair. Scientists send these laser pulses to a magnetic sample and measure how fast it switches its magnetization direction using a spin analyzer. By moving the laser beam, even the switching of arbitrary patterns can be achieved. The fundamental limitation of the speed of the data storage is still an open question, but the researchers know that it can be at least 1,000 times faster than the currently available technology. Magnetism is indeed great for data storage, but over the last years physicists have realized that it is also good for data processing. Uh, we do need to search for new types of computers and the idea is to use magnetic waves, so-called spin waves, and their quanta magnons to process data. The red arrows on this screen represent the magnetization as for data storage. However, for logic operations, you do not completely flip the magnetization, but only slightly tilt it. The magnetization will start to rotate, and this motion spreads in the form of a wave, which scientists call a spin wave. This then transports information for low-power data processing. And this is just the beginning. Demonstrators have been developed in various labs around the world, now the task is to make them smaller and faster and to combine many spin wave logic units into a single chip. We face a major global challenge. We need to transform our society to renewable energy technologies. 
In order to develop these technologies, we depend on critical raw materials. These are strategic elements such as rare earth elements, but also cobalt and lithium. In short, the energy transition is the materials transition. This is particularly true for high-performance permanent magnets, but also for magnets for magnetic refrigeration. In order to make a high-performance magnet for energy applications, one needs to identify new intermetallic compounds with excellent intrinsic magnetic properties. The elements are mixed with each other in an arc melter to form the right phase with the right crystal structure. Then the next step is to process this pre-alloy by rapid quenching in a melt spinner into a nanocrystalline material. The liquid metal is cooled down by 1 million Kelvin per second when it hits the copper wheel. The rapidly quenched powder is finally hot pressed into a fully dense and highly textured bulk magnet. This can go straight into the application. Key applications include electromobility. In mobility and transportation, electromotors will replace the traditional combustion engine. High-performance magnetic materials, both hard and soft, make these motors small, light and efficient. Their generated torque scales with the remnant magnetization of the rare earth permanent magnet. In modern direct drive wind turbines, again, permanent magnets are used to make the generator small, efficient and robust for difficult to reach offshore locations. For one megawatt produced, we use half a ton of magnets and 30% of this weight is rare earth elements. Magnetic systems also contribute to marine animal conservation efforts by monitoring animal behavior. And magnetic resonance imaging is widely used for medical diagnostics, allowing one to obtain images through the solid body to detect pathological conditions such as cancer, stroke, cardiovascular or neurological diseases, among others. In current preclinical research, imaging is being combined with nanotechnology, enabling the development of novel diagnostic strategies through magnetic nanomaterials used to generate increased image contrast. The latest results are showcased at major conferences where thousands of researchers from academia and industry exchange ideas. For young academics, networking at conferences also helps to keep track of employment opportunities generated by the science and technology of SPIN. SPIN is everywhere. It combines exciting science and possible pervasive and ubiquitous applications from sensors to low-power information technology memory and logic. Furthermore, SPIN enables electromobility and green power generation. So I hope you enjoyed the video and we also learned already something from it. And now it's time to switch to the next part of the lecture, which is about atomic origin of magnetism.